next pre presenter is uh, Dr. Kevin Clark back in action. Uh, once again, he's a professor at St. Patrick's Seminary and University in Menlo Park. Uh, his field of expertise is the patristic interpretation of scripture, but he also teaches in church history and scripture itself. And uh, he has four kids, and uh, we are continuing to pray for his wife, you know, as, um, as he is here with us. And uh, Dr. Kevin Clark will be presenting on an intriguing theme that I think we'll all find very enriching for our, our lives, our spirituality, and our understanding of the priest, and also the understanding of, of the Holy Mass. But this lecture from Dr. Kevin Clark is entitled, Fleshly Veil, Precious Blood, the Melchizedekian Priest and Victim. Thank you as always, Father Theodore, and it's uh, great to be here again this morning. Um, so I, I want to begin today with my uh, favorite prayer before scripture study from uh, Maximus the Confessor. <clears throat> so let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, O all-hymned word of God, and give us, in the degree commensurate to us, the revelation of your own words. Remove the thickness of the veils that cover them, and show us O Christ, the beauty of their inner meanings. Take us by our right hand, that is, the intellective power within us, and guiding us in the way of your commandments, lead us to the place of your wondrous tabernacle, unto the very house of God, with a voice of rejoicing and confession, so that through confession manifested in practice, and through joy, realized in contemplation, we too may be counted worthy to come to the ineffable place of your feasting and join our voices of praise to those who spiritually keep festival, singing with the silent voices of the intellect the praises of the knowledge of the unutterable mysteries. <clears throat> and forgive me, O Christ, and have mercy on me, for at the command of your worthy servants, I have recklessly dared to attempt things beyond my power and enlighten my unenlightened mind for the contemplation of the questions now before me, so that you may be glorified even more for giving light to eyes that were blind and articulate speech to a tongue that was mute. St. Paul, pray for us in the name of the Father of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so uh, a <clears throat> brief a preface to this talk. Um, I, uh, I, f I first had a uh, Hebrews class with uh, Father James Swetnam when I was a, a master's student at Franciscan University. Uh, Scott Hahn invited Father Swetnam, uh, who was a professor at the uh, Pontifical Biblical Institute, and he came and, uh, and guest uh, taught our Hebrews class, and it was fantastic. One of the things he did, uh, you know, when, when I first went to Franciscan, I was, I was, I was glad at the time that uh, Greek and Latin weren't required. <laughs> but uh, Father Swetnam really uh, woke me up to the importance of learning the original languages. One of the things that he did in his class was that he provided us with his own translation of the Epistle to the Hebrews. And, um, and so, uh, uh, last year, uh, my first uh, uh, chance to teach the Epistle to the Hebrews uh, at the seminary, I did the same for uh, my seminarians. I provided them my own translation of Hebrews. So um, anyway, that again is online uh, on academia.edu, but um, I, I owe, um, you know, uh, most of my insights here to, uh, to, to Father Swetnam and, and his uh, in incredible learning. He's, uh, he's in retirement uh, in St. Louis. Uh, uh, so when I was a visiting professor at Kenrick Glen and I had the uh, uh, opportunity to catch up with him, it was very, uh, very good. So let me begin. <clears throat> okay, this quote is from uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Having therefore boldness 
to access the Holy of Holies, brothers, by the blood of Jesus, which innovated for us a fresh and living way through the veil, that is, his flesh. And having a great priest over the house of God, let us come with a true heart and full assurance of faith, hearts having been sprinkled from an evil conscience, and the body having been washed, washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of hope unwaveringly, for the one who promises is faithful. So perhaps you have uh, found yourself perplexed with Magdalene at do not hold on to me in John 20. Uh, I have. How could it be better for Christ to go away? The, the answer in the Gospel of John is obviously, well, the Spirit. He goes to send the Spirit. In Hebrews, the answer uh, to that question is more the new priesthood of Jesus Christ. Christ opens the way to heaven for us by his ascension, which is the completion of his sacrifice. And the good news is that participation in the sacramental economy then lifts, up, lifts us up to his throne. This is the message, the core message of the author of the epistle to the Hebrews. So as we, in my talk with, on the Gospel of John, I want to briefly introduce you to the epistle and uh, to its author. The, the epistle, if you've read it, it, you'll notice it's all about the radical superiority of Christ's priesthood. And so that, that's one of the reasons our separated brethren struggle to understand what they read here. Uh, like John, Hebrews has a prologue uh, that informs the rest of the epistle. Here, here is that all-important text, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. After God spoke of old in manifold and diverse ways to the fathers in the prophets, upon these last days he spoke to us in a son, whom he established as the heir of of all things, through whom he also made the ages, who being the effulgence of glory and stamp of his subsistence, bearing all things by the word of power, after he made purification of sins, he sat at the right hand of the majesty in the heights, having become so much better than angels, as he has inherited a name so much more excellent than theirs. So a brief word about docetism, which is something that the early church was dealing with at the time that most of the um, uh, New Testament writings were being written. And, and docetism actually very much pertains to our, our conference theme. It was one of the, the first heresies, and it sought to preserve the distance between God and creation by suggesting that Christ only seemed to become flesh. That's where the word docetism comes from from dokeo in Greek, which means to seem or appear. And so perhaps in this epistle, we can detect a certain anti-docetic uh, Christology uh, in, in the emphasis upon Christ becoming flesh. In, in 1 John, which is a very strongly anti-docetic uh, work, we see that there are Christian pretenders who... Uh, who deny that Christ came in the flesh, and who John says have the spirit of the Antichrist. But there was also this tendency within Docetism to espouse what we might call an angel Christology, uh, that, that Christ was only an angel who became flesh. So it's interesting that the, the apostle here uh, begins with this insistence that the Son is so much superior to the angels. Making Christ an angel would prevent him from accomplishing the work of our redemption, as we, we know from the patristic teachings. So we read in, in chapter 2, uh, Therefore, since the children have communion of blood and flesh, and he similarly partook of them, so that through death he should abolish the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil, and he should release those who by fear of death were subject to slavery all life long. For surely he did not lay hold of angels, but he laid hold of the seed of Abraham. 
whence he ought to be made like the brothers in every way, so that he should become a merciful and faithful high priest of divine things, unto the propitiation of the sins of the people. For the one who having been tested has suffered, uh, for by the one who ha having been tested has suffered, he can help those being tested. But our author does not stop there. Rather, he shows Christ's superiority to Moses, uh, the, the first Jesus, Joshua. Uh, in um, th There's a play on the names of uh, Joshua and Jesus in chapter 4, because in the Greek, uh, Jesus and Jesus are, are the names. Uh, superiority to Aaron, superiority to uh, Levi. The apostle is careful to distinguish between the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Jesus Christ. The inferiority of the Le Levitical priesthood strikes us as particularly supersessionist. Uh, super supersessionism is a word that, that denotes the, um, uh, an approach to the relation between the uh, two covenants that the one has, uh, that the new covenant has superseded uh, the other, and is very much uh, out of favor uh, theologically these days. But, um, but. Hebrews really strikes us with this um, uh, this sense in which the the new takes the place of the old. <clears throat> so, in fact, the Old Testament figure who most coincides with the person of Christ in Hebrews, well, that is Melchizedek, the priest king of Salem. <clears throat> in fact, the figure of Melchizedek is so important in Hebrews. It almost seems that the other authors of the New Testament have really missed the boat. Uh, until you realize that the Melchizedek Psalm, Psalm 110, is quoted in all the synoptics, at Peter's Pentecost speech in Acts, and in several uh, Pauline epistles. So while Melchizedek isn't explicitly named, uh, uh, you, you, you know that this, this Psalm 10, 110, is, where it comes up, is very much wrapped up in the very question of the identity of Christ. You know, the, it begins, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And, and, and this is the critical moment when Jesus uh, says, if the Lord said, if, if David calls him Lord, how is he uh, his son? And, and they had no more answers for him, right? So um, the, the key thing to remember is that when the authors of Scripture quote a verse, they're, they, they call to mind the whole uh, psalm. So... Hebrews builds up to a head in chapters 8 through 10, describing in words that challenge our ecumenical sensibilities how the new covenant almost seems to replace the old. And chapters 11 through 13 place the Christian community in line with the salvation history of Israel and then encourages believers to follow Christ outside the camp and offer up a sacrifice of praise. More on this later. Uh, briefly, it is important to discuss the author whose theological brilliance is evident to all. There's no small controversy over who the author is. The Church Fathers unanimously, uh, fairly unanimously, unanimously regard Paul as the author to the, the uh, epistle to the Hebrews, even though the epistle does not begin in the usual Pauline fashion. Uh, my, my mentor, uh, Father Swetnam, also regarded Paul as the, uh, the author. Uh, Origen in the early church is famously misquoted as saying, who knows who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews? But scholars who drop this quote ignore the fact that Origen had referred to Paul's words in the epistle uh, uh, and that Origen himself wrote, I'm sorry, Origen had often referred to the words as Paul's in the epistle and that Origen himself wrote that he planned to write a demonstration that the epistle was Pauline in origin. For the question of Origen's approach, I would point you to a very fine essay by my uh, Bay, Area Bay Area colleague, Matthew Thomas, in New Testament Study 65. Um, nevertheless, for those of you who are uh, unwilling to countenance the, the hypothesis that Paul wrote Hebrew, Hebrews, I will simply refer to Paul as the the apostle in this talk, so that it's not too grating for you. <clears throat> but anyway, there are many plausible theories about authorship uh, of Hebrews out there. Luther, for example, suggested Apollos, 
and this theory has come to gain some traction uh, even among Catholic scholars. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, the question of the authorship of Hebrews will, will never move beyond hypothesis. In other words, we will have to wait until the eschaton. Uh, for my part, I'm placing something of a Pascal, Pascal's wager on Pauline authorship, so he's not mad, mad at me uh, if, I, if, I, if I get there. Um, but anyway, I, I do think it's the most plausible. Uh, someday I hope to write my own demonstration of Pauline authorship, and I've begun gathering some data on this, but um, I'm, I'm not sure that this is quite the moment for ending my career in biblical theology. <laughs> So the, the author, uh, as we see from the end of the epistle, is uh, 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 writing to either from Rome or to Rome to Jewish Christians, depending on how one takes verse 13, uh, 24, those from Italy greet you. So is he saying in, out, outside of Italy that you know, Italians who are, who are far away are greeting you, or is he saying from, uh, from Italy? It, it's an interesting question. So anyway, uh, let us now uh, explore the apostles' understanding of propitiation in the letter to the Hebrews and whether the church fathers made a connection between the mass and, and the epistle. Uh, the primary dialogue partner, John Calvin, helps uh, set the table for the significance of the epistle. Is he correct in thinking that this letter in particular does not... It, admit of a Eucharistic reading. Uh, sacrificial propitiation uh, has taken on a rather negative connotation, such that one imagines an exceedingly offended uh, deity thirsty for a victim offering to uh, assuage his seething, seething passions. This is the picture one gets from many sacrificial systems throughout pagan antiquity, not only that, but post-Enlightenment philosophers follow Immanuel Kant, who viewed sacrificial si systems as profanations of earlier pure religion. Kant develops a dichot dichotomous theory of what he calls pure religious faith and, uh, and, uh, 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 and historical faith in his book, Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone. He, gra he grants primacy to pure religious faith, which is, of course, what he tells you religion is. Historical faith, on the other hand, is later in time and restricted in its application in his view. He is opposed to authority and hierarchy, sacrifice, holiness, and so on. When Kant speaks of pure religious faith, he is referring to rationality and the moral law. When he speaks of historical faith, he is referring to revealed faith or ecclesiastical faith that rests on sacred scripture. The universal accessibility of pure religious faith to all humanity is, for Kant, the only faith that is universally binding. God uh, can't really reveal himself in time and privilege a certain people with uh, a uh, relationship. Uh, um, so... This having become ingrained in Western thought helps us to explain the, mo the modern endeavor to, to remove propitiation in the process of creating a crea Christianity devoid of sacrifice. So having confronted the bias against uh, propitiation itself, one can now consider the basic idea, which is at the heart of natural religion. Man stands in need of God's help. Recognizing this, man attempts to make an offering to God. If successful, the oblation is destroyed so that its benefits are not enjoyed by the one offering or by a bystander. The offering ascends then to, to God in some manner. God is free to accept the offering. You know, perhaps you're thinking of the sacrifices of Cain and Abel and how, uh, uh, how differently they were received. God is also free to grant a gift or grace in return. So it's, it's really important to establish the freedom of the divine acceptance and response because a defective model of propitiation turns God into some sort of vending machine. 
Offering goes in, goodies come out. And that is nearly as repulsive as the idea of a deity swooning with bloodlust. No, from the beginning of the scriptures, a careful reading will refute such a mechanistic idea. It's easy to, to read, misread the Hebrew scriptures and think that God is per se opposed to sacrifice. But that would be incorrect. Sacrifice is at the heart of natural religion because religion itself is a moral virtue of justice and sacrifice is one of its acts. In sinning, man commits an act that is a privation in the order of justice. And so he then becomes a debtor to God and to his fellow man. Alternatively, man is confronted with some sort of privation in the natural order whereby he, he turns to God. Man is a gift-bearing animal. And perhaps some of you, this is your love language, uh, uh, giving gifts. Attempts to persuade God to ease or remove the debt or, uh, uh, or pathos is is uh, in our nature because wealth in ancient times took the form of crops livestock and progeny such were the primary sacri sacrificial o oblations whatever is offered it ought to be precious we saw the uh, the uh, depictions of the sacrifice of Isaac what could be more precious than Isaac now, the revealed Mosaic law did not call for human sacrifice, but it did construct a system of various sacrifices meant to redress various evils, both moral and physical. Aquinas gives three purposes of sacrifices. Remission of sin, preservation of grace, and union with God. Uh, while this paper is constrained from treating that sacrificial system at length. It is within the sacrificial context that Christ made his own offering to God, both in profound continuity and in profound newness. It seems to be the project of the letter to the Hebrews to explore both facts. The sacrifice had to be new because of the inherent imperfection of the old, the old law's sacrificial system. See, for example, chapter 10, verse 1. Christ's sacrifice meets all the re requirements of a sacrifice. He offers something, his body and his will. It is consumed by an act of sacrifice, 926. It ascends to God, chapter 8, verse 1. The sacrifice is pleasing to God, chapter 5, verse 7. And then God rewards the sacrifice by giving grace, 2, 9, 4, 14 through 16, uh, 10, 14. Consider Aquinas who comments on Hebrews 8, 3, tracing the trajectory of Christ's oblation through to its effect, namely unity with God. Aquinas says, It was, moreover, so pure an oblation because his, fl his flesh had not the stain of sin. Quoting Exodus, and it shall be a lamb without blemish, a male of one year. Likewise, it was a fitting oblation because it is fitting that man should make satisfaction for man. Below, in 914, continue with Aquinas here, he offered himself unspotted unto God. In the same manner, it was an oblation apt to be immolated because his flesh was mortal. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Again, he is the same as he to whom he is offered. I and the Father are one. Finally, he unites to God those for whom he is offered, that they all may be one as thou, Father, and me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. End quote. The sacrifice of Christ, according to the, the, author, to, uh, the epistle, happens... F -ha -pax, uh, which means once for all. This is an adverb that means once for all. But he will appear a second time in 928. The letter uh, presents an interesting challenge, right? The Christ offers the one 
definitive sacrifice, but then there are many exhortations throughout the epistle, some of which are decidedly cultic. So how can there be cultic activities when Christ offered himself once for all? This is essentially John Calvin's objection to the Catholic Mass. Does ephapox mean the same thing for the author of the epistle to the Hebrews as it does for Calvin? That's really the key question here. The answer is no. <clears throat> the reason is it is a question is because Calvin claims to know that once and for all means not only a sacrifice to end all sacrifices, but also uh, uh, a sacrifice to end all sacrifice. The ambiguity of the uh, uh, preceding clause serves to show the lack of clarity in describing what the sacrifice of Christ put an end to. The Catholic understanding is that the sacrifice of Christ was accomplished once and for all and put an end to animal sacrifices under the Mosaic law. Calvin, on the other hand, understands the once for all to refer to the end of cultic propitiatory sacrifice as such. Thus, the propitiatory theology of the sacrifice of the Mass is the aim of his invective. So, is he correct that this uh, letter does not admit of a Eucharistic reading? Did the, the letter uh, to the Hebrews remain concealed for many centuries as a proof text against the liturgy? Uh, Calvin, who lived from 1509 to 1564, wrote his Institutes of Christian Religion over the course of several decades, from the publication of the first edition in 1536 to uh, his last edition, published in 1562. The, the scope was vast and enduring in terms of its influence. The Council of Trent held its session on the doctrine and canons of the sacrifice of the Mass in 1562, engaging many of the issues Calvin wrangles with in his Institutes. In his highly polemical chapter on the Popish Mass, Calvin cites Hebrews more than any other book in the Bible. In his eyes, the letter to the Hebrews was definitive proof that Catholics were doing the work of Satan himself. It is worth noting that the very epistle to which Calvin ap uh, uh, appeals, Luther wanted to remove from the canon. Uh, Calvin views the Mass as a real threat to Calvary. He says in one place that, quote, the cross of Christ is overthrown the moment the altar is erected. Elsewhere, he questions uh, the subjective experience. Quote, For who can think that he has been redeemed by the death of Christ when he sees a new redemption in the Mass? Who can feel confident that his sins have been remitted when he sees a new remission? End quote. Calvin relies particularly on uh, Hebrews 9 as he develops his invective. He argues that if Christ is sacrificed at the Catholic Mass, then he must be cruelly slain at every moment in a thousand places. Here he turns to the epistle to the Hebrews to bear witness on his account, citing uh, 9, 25 to 26. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, for then he would, would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. Calvin makes an interesting concession in this section, namely that, quote, they are ready with an answer by which they even charge us with calumny. For they say that we object to them, uh, for they say that, that we object to them what they never thought and could not even think. End quote. The intention of Catholics does not matter to Calvin. The dogma of the real presence, ipso facto, would require blood if it were to be a real sacrifice, he says. It is clear that Calvin's uh, uh, interlocutors are insisting repeatedly that the sacrifice of the Mass is unbloody. Right? That is our, our doctrine, the Mass, the, the sacrifice is, is unbloody. The Council of Trent uh, does say that the offering of the Mass is the same as the offering on Calvary, but that the manner of offering is different. One of the serious difficulties of Calvin's approach is that he conflates the Levitical priesthood with the Catholic priesthood. He does not grant that his opponents have a more nuanced view. 
the tradition has, has always been to view the ministerial priesthood of the new covenant as essentially participatory in the one high priesthood of Christ, which uh, Archbishop said so uh, marvelously with the uh, Christ incarnate in the, in the priest. Whereas the Levitical priesthood was mediated by, uh, by men. Leviate, Levites mediate in the Old Covenant, and Christ himself is the one mediator in the New, in whom all mediation participates. The subtleties of such a, a, a view are dismissed outright by Calvin. All priesthood after Christ is to miss the point of Scripture. In Christ, all priestly office is closed and terminated, in his words. The priests were not real priests, but only uh, ministers to distribute a sacred feast. Regarding the priesthood of Melchizedek, Calvin asks a, que a key question, quote, But if the oblation of Melchizedek was a figure of the sacrifice of the Mass, I ask, would the apostle who goes uh, into the minutest details have forgotten a matter so grave and serious? So uh, let's look more closely at the letter of Hebrews itself. You, you, you patiently endured uh, Calvin, uh, Calvin's words very well, so uh, let's get to something more, more edifying. One of the greatest challenges in interpreting the letter to the Hebrews is the cloud of mystery surrounding the text. At this point, we ought to refre reflect briefly upon the notion of Hebrews uh, of the offering of the body of Jesus, Ephapax, once for all. So Calvin's force of this word is very muscular, once for all, period, end of story. The adverb ephapax, though, occurs uh, only five times in all of the Greek scriptures, each time in, uh, in, in the New Testament, three of which occur in the letter to the Hebrews, the two others in Romans and 1 Corinthians. Uh, the, the RSV translate this, translates this ver the adverb once for all, in each case except 1 Corinthians, is formed by two words, epi, which means upon, and hapax, which means once. And so the word seems to have uh, an intensification of the idea of something happening once. It's like saying once isn't quite good enough, and so once. <laughs> uh, so uh, a notional equivalent might be something like uh, once upon a time, or perhaps it might be better thought of as, as at an exceedingly important moment that has no parallel. Here is a, a question one ought to answer in translating this word. Can ephapax be thought of as an exemplary once that can include future participatory instantiations, or is the for force once and never again? This leads to a question for what we call canonical criticism, which regards the harmony of Scripture with itself. What ought one to do with the bread of life discourse and the messianic expectation that the Messiah, when he came, would rain down bread from heaven? Brent Petrie points out in uh, the rabbinic thought in this regard from uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Barakiah in the 3rd or 4th century. Quoting Petrie, Rabbi Barakiah said in the name of Rabbi Isaac, at the first redeemer Moses was so, as the first redeemer Moses was, so shall the later redeemer, the Messiah, be. What is stated of the former rede redeemer? And Moses took his wife and, and his sons and set them upon an ass. Similarly, will it be with the later latter redeemer, as is stated, lowly and riding upon an ass? As the former Redeemer caused manna to descend, as it is stated, Behold, I will cause uh, to rain bread from heaven for you, so will the latter Redeemer cause manna to descend, as it is stated, May, be, may he be a rich grain field in the land. End quote. This helps to explain something of the messianic fervor in the Joannine account of the multiplication of the fish and the loaves. You read chapter 6 of John. You know the people, when they saw the, um, they ate their fill and there's 12 baskets of fragments left over. Uh, and they said, uh, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. And they tried to take him by force and make him king. 
but you can see they're, they're hinting at, they want him to repeat this miracle. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. You know, what sign will you do? So it is precisely this messianic thought that Jesus corrects later in the chapter. He would not have a mere political kingdom, but a Eucharistic kingdom, hence the enthronement of the apostles over the 12 tribes at the Last Supper. True, be- true bread is in their presence. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. It is not inconsequential that the institution narrative is attested not only in all three synoptic accounts, but also in 1 Corinthians. Uh, Petrie is right to point out that there, are, that there are strong parallels between the bread of life discourse and the institution narratives. So back to Hebrew, uh, Hebrews, do we find a continued eating of bread, uh, of such bread? Interestingly, the only place, uh, the only reference to bread in Hebrews is in 9.2 wherein the apostle refers to the bread of the presence. What is this strange bread? In, in the Hebrew, uh, le- lehem panim, literally the bread of the face. Petrie points out that the giving of this bread was a commemoration of the giving of the law on Sinai. And so this mysterious bread was meant to be a kind of memorial to the heavenly banquet in which Moses and the elders saw the God of Israel, while they ate and drank. Perhaps one can take it a step further. If the author of Hebrews was familiar with the narrative account of the disciples plucking grain on the Sabbath, the connection to the banquet feasting would be even stronger. When the Pharisees ridicule Christ for, follow, for allowing his disciples to pluck grain on the Sabbath, he says, quote, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. End quote. If the Hebrews audience was familiar with that account, a reasonable presumption this may help explain the reference in Hebrews 13 where he says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. The Christian community, like David and his men, partake of the bread of presence. The letter to the Hebrews is problematic for Calvin's account, or Calvin's argument for a number of reasons. First of all, the theology of Hebrews is participatory because of the shared humanity of Christ and his brethren. For example, 3, uh, 1. Therefore, holy brethren, who share in the heavenly call, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Uh, the Greek here, uh, klesios ep uraniu metakoi, is perhaps better translated as participants in a heavenly call. Nonetheless, the phrase is striking in its connection with the high priesthood of Christ in the next clause. Further, there is the uh, calling from uh, the, the calling from heaven harkens to five, four through six. Uh, quote, and someone cannot take the honor of priesthood to himself, but he is called by God, even as was Aaron. Thus also Christ did not glorify himself to be made high priest, but the one who spoke to him did. You are my son. I have begotten you today. Just as also in another place, he says, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, end quote. Notwithstanding the uh, once-for-all nature of Christ's sacrifice, the propitiatory effect of Christ's sacrifice continues in heaven. The apostle writes that Christ had to be make, made like his brethren in every respect so that he might become a, a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make expiation for the sins of the people. The Douay says uh, that he might be a propitiation. The mystery is that though his sacrifice was completed, his, his humanity continues to have a propitiatory and active effect in the heavens. Uh, this is uh, 
from chapter 7 through chapter 8, uh, verse, picking up verse 26. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, having been set apart from sinners, and being higher than the heavens, who does not have daily need, as the high priests do, first to offer sacrifice for his own sins, later to offer sacrifices for those sins of the people. For uh, this he, offering himself, did once for all. For the law establishes men to be high priests having weaknesses, but the word sworn, sorry, weakness, but the word sworn after the law uh, establishes a son to be high priest, his having been perfected forever. But this is the chief point here, uh, kephalion, which is sometimes translated as chapter, but like this is Paul's main point. But this is the chief point of the things being said. We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a laetergos, a minister of the holy of holies and of the true tent, which not man, but the Lord pitched, end quote. This is a rather significant moment in the epistle that is uh, somehow often glossed over. The apostle calls it the kephalion, the main point. At least in the mind of the author, this is significant in understanding the meaning of the mystery being articulated. So when you read the epistle of the Hebrews, slow down around chapter 8, because that's really where it start, he starts to get to his, his head. The sacrifice is completed, yet there remains something divinely ongoing about it. This is where human meets divine, which leads to the next point. That heavenly mystery is connected with the distribution of grace. And this comes forth very strongly in one of the most well-known passages in chapter 4. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than every two-edged sword, and he pierces unto the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and he is judge of the thoughts and conceptions of the heart. And no creature is invisible before him, but all things are naked and vulnerable before his eyes. The word in us is before him. Having therefore a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us lay hold of the confession for we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested similarly in, in all ways apart from sin. Let us therefore approach with boldness the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace unto timely help. Uh, this is an exhortation as is clearly evident from the subjunctives. The apostle's audience is expected to do something. How can one approach the throne of grace which is in heaven or uh, uh, to receive help for time of need? It cannot be understood uh, except, uh, time of need cannot be understood except for earthly sojourn. But if Calvin is right in, uh, in, in light of this passage, who can ascend into the heavens to bring Christ down? Indeed, it seems most certain that the apostle and his audience would have had something liturgical in mind. This works because of the power of the ascension and the enthronement in the Paschal mystery. God has accepted the propitiatory offering of Christ's Pasch, and he responds by the ongoing gr gift of grace to the church throughout its life every time the sacrifice is commemorated, right? every time it is remembered. Finally, how could it have escaped anyone that the paradigmatic Old Testament figure for the priesthood, priesthood of Christ is Melchizedek, who offered bread and wine? Christ, too, offers bread and wine at the Last Supper. Yet it is not the bread and wine which saves us, but the, body, the bloody paschal sacrifice united in the offering of bread and wine, which he com commanded his apostles to do commemoratively. Uh, here is, is a very important passage in Hebrews that we uh, encounter in the Mass often. Chapter uh, 10, verses 5 through 10. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, 
but a body you prepared for me. You took no pleasure in holocausts and sin offerings. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the chapter of the book, it has been written about me to do, O God, your will. Is saying above that sacrifices and offerings and holocausts and sin offerings you neither willed nor took pleasure in, which things are offered according to the law. Then he has said, Behold, I come to do, O God, your will. He takes away the first, so that the second should stand, in which we are those who are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now it is noteworthy that the psalm that the apostle quotes here uh, Psalm 40, uh, is he, uh, he sides with a particular textual variant. So if you read Psalm 40, you might notice that uh, a, an, ear, a, a, an ear is prepared rather than a body. So the apostle follows several really important codices, uh, which uh, at, the, at that point, you know, I should say, um, he agrees with several uh, important codices that we have. Uh, in terms of the, the word soma, or body. So, um, uh, the, the, let's skip ahead a little bit. Um, the Holocaust and sin offerings did not please God, but the offering of the body in conjunction with the complicit will of Christ did indeed please him. Hebrews 13 is problematic for Calvin's position, especially the juxtaposition of Hebrews 13.10, where the apostle says, We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. And then 13.15, where the apostle says, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Here, Thusia Inesios in the Greek. What is this about eating from an altar? And e even though Calvin would read sacrifice of praise as purely a spiritual sacrifice, as sort of a prayer of the lips, how can any sacrifice be offered up without the death of a victim? It would seem that in order to escape, to escape such a, a text, he would have to d dismiss the reference as pure metaphor. Uh, Swetnam, uh, Father Swetnam has argued very convincingly in this regard of the strong parallels between the sacrifice of praise, the uh, jevak toda, offering in the Old Testament, uh, in, in the Latin is sacrificium laudis, uh, it, which was a thank offering described in Leviticus elsewhere. He, uh, Swetnam argues that the framing that is quite evident in chapter 13 is uh, centered on describing the Christian toda. He further argues that the todah, uh, and the, the todah is, of course, the, uh, um, the offering of, of bread in the, the liturgy, the Eucharist. He further argues that the todah is used in Hebrews 13 in the same integrity that it has in Leviticus 7. That is, there is no indication that the bloody death of Jesus is being spiritualized, and thus there is no reason to think that the, uh, the other two aspects, which are the consumption of food, and the use of verbal prayer are being spiritualized either. The Hebrew phrase is translated throughout the Septuagint uh, as Thusia Inesios. From Swetnam's research, we ask then if it referred to a sacrifice, if Thusia Inesios referred to a real sacrificial rite involving bread, and this is the very phrase chosen by the apostle in Hebrews 13. What grounds will we have in interpreting this phrase merely spiritually, as Calvin does? Uh, briefly, I want to look at the uh, the, the fathers, um, and then hopefully I can get to Aquinas, but I'm not sure if I'll, I'll have time. Um, so finding a Eucharistic reading of the letter to the Hebrews and the fathers can be a bit of a challenge. Right? There are a number of reasons for this, though. The first factor is called the, the disciplini arcani, the dis discipline of, of silence, which covered not only the Eucharist and the rites of initiation, but also the creed and the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Edward Yarnold says the disciplini, uh, uh, disciplina arcani had taken its effect by the time of Tertullian. Consider this excerpt from a homily by Chrysostom. If we draw to ourselves 
the beams of the sun of righteousness, the lifting up of hands, as it, as it is said, as an evening sacrifice. With our hands, let us also lift up our mind. Ye who have been initiated in the mysteries know what I mean. Perhaps, too, ye recognize the expression and comprehend what I am hinting at. Let us raise up our thoughts on high. End quote. Sorry, I was using an old translation. I forgot to clean up the uh, Victorian language. Anyway, he is, he is clearly in the homily referring indirectly to the Eucharist, uh, but to a mixed audience of, of initiates and catechumens. So he's always addressing the uninitiated, so he must be careful. And this might help to explain the lack of real presence language uh, in body, blood, soul, and divinity language in antiquity. Similarly, Epiphanius once described the Last Supper saying, quote, He stood up at the, su at the supper, took these things, and gave, si and gave thanks, saying, This is my this. <laughs> End quote. The initiates in the audience know immediately and the uninitiated are left thirsting to know, an, an advantage that evangelization no longer has. As Arnold says, it is a natural instinct to be uh, reticent about something one holds precious. Publicity cheapens. And in the publication of everything we hold sacred, there's been a loss, not only for ourselves, but perhaps also for non-Christians. But uh, the loss is irreparable. There's no way in which a secrecy can be reestablished. And that being said, there's also the uh, problem for language. Jesus is spoken of as a high priest, Archiarius, uh, uniquely in Hebrews. But nowhere does the New Testament use the word priest, Ierius, Hierius, to refer to the ministerial priesthood as we know it. Why? Because first century Christians primarily needed to know uh, needed somehow to distinguish between the Levitical priesthood, still thriving in Jerusalem, and the ministerial priesthood instituted by Christ. The word itself uh, is connected etymologically with the word te temple, hieron. It would have been uh, a, an interpretive challenge uh, as first century recipients of the Christian scriptures would have thought instantly of the temple sacrifice. Um, skipping ahead, because of the discipline of Arcani, this forces a glimpse into the first couple of centuries of early Christianity. One might expect uh, more, uh, more time would be needed for such a theological development as real presence, but a look at the sources yields a surprising harvest. One wonders how Calvin would have, been, would have responded had the writings of the Apostolic Fathers been discovered in or before his lifetime. The Didache of the Twelve Apostles was, was discovered in 1873 a document that many scholars date in the first century. It shows that the nascent, early, uh, nascent church viewed the Eucharist as a sacrificial rite. Here's from the Didache. On the, Lord's day, uh, on the Lord's own day, gather together and break bread and give thanks, having first confessed your sins so that your sacrifice may be pure. But let no one who has a quarrel with a companion join you until they have been reconciled that your sacrifice may not be defiled. For this is the sacrifice concerning which the Lord said, in every place and time, offer me a pure sacrifice, for I am a great king, says the Lord, and my name is marvelous among the nations." End quote. This profoundly important work uh, not only refers to the Eucharist as a sacrifice, even the sacrifice of the community, but the author twice says, your sacrifice. The Didache identifies the prophecy of Malachi uh, as fulfilled in the Christian Eucharist. Nowhere in the writings in the New Testament do the apostolic author, authors explicitly make this connection, but uh, well grounded in the tradition, it was indeed. First Clement provides the first instance, so to speak, of a witness to Hebrews in early Christianity. As such, uh, First Clement is vital to the dating of the epistle. If you want to say the epistle of Hebrews is written later, you have to push First Clement back later. Uh, so, uh, First Clement was written sometime in the last decade, last two decades of the first century. Uh, there, there are multiple references to the epistle throughout uh, First Clement. Examining the quoted material throughout the letter, one can make quite a case that First Clement is reading Hebrews eucharistically. 
Indeed, it would be difficult to find an alternative reading for, for a phrase such as the high priest of our offerings. Can that be read as though our offerings referred to the offerings of prayer in general? Perhaps, but within its context, first, uh, uh, in First Clement, one sees some strikingly liturgical themes. For instance, uh, in, uh, earlier within this section of the epistle, one reads, The good worker receives the bread of his labor confidently, but the one who is lazy and careless does not look his employer in the face. Perhaps this is a moral exhortation, but the choice of bread rather than wages uh, seems deliberate, as the context demonstrates. Um, and of course, you all know about the reference that uh, Justin Martyr uh, 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 makes for the Christian Eucharist in the second century. So I'm short on time. I'm going to go ahead and um, skip over Aquinas and Trent. Uh, I, I overwrote this paper, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience. But uh, this happens to the best of us sometimes. Um, <laughs> so uh, in conclusion, uh, considering the evidence from the uh, letter to the Hebrews and the interpretation taken up immediately by the very first church fathers, it seems quite unjustified to argue that the sacrificial offering of the Eucharist by the ministerial priesthood as it exists in the Catholic tradition was not intended by the apostle himself. As, when, as was demonstrated, it was very clear in the epistle that once for all does not mean once and never again, not even in a different manner. It is not at all unbecoming to read Hebrews with a, a Eucharistic hermeneutic. Perhaps some benefit of the doubt can be extended to Calvin, especially in light of five centuries of development and patristic studies. Uh, Calvin did not have access to as many of the church fathers as we do today, certainly not the apostolic fathers, who are some of the most valuable witnesses uh, because of the later discipline of the secrets. Nonetheless, without the benefits academics enjoy today, Thomas Aquinas and the Council of Trent uh, did not break stride with, uh, uh, with those from before, perfectly capturing the very theology that one finds in the early church. Indeed, this example of living tradition is at the true core of Catholic identity as such. And I should add, even though I skipped over them, uh, Aquinas, in his usual way, uh, anticipates the objections of Calvin before Calvin even made them. And so if you, if you, if you read uh, his, his commentary on the epistle to the Hebrews, you'll, you'll see it's a very anti-Calvinist work before Calvin ever came along. Um, so... Um, uh, when you spend that much time in prayer before the Eucharist, the Lord, the Lord uh, gives you hints. He shows you things uh, that you should talk about. And then Trent, of course, makes the uh, a bloody and unbloody distinction when it comes to the... And we can talk about that in the uh, Q&A if you like. Um, but... Uh, um, so, from the... From the, the very fact that Christ said, do this and the church did it, it came to understand, and the church came to understand that somehow in mystery it was participating in the very sacrifice of Christ. And thus, the Eucharistic offering itself is a sacrifice. Some may debate when this realization first occurred. I suggest it was at the moment they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. As I pointed out in the beginning, there's become to, come to be such an aversion, even a defensive hostility uh, to these ideas of sacrifice and propitiation. God would not need to be appeased, they argue. Sacrifice and propitiation simply no longer have room in postmodern Western minds. If anything, such a position is a capitulation to Calvin rather than an embrace of Catholic sacramental tradition. Believers, however, have the mind of Christ. Sacrifice and propitiation are part of the received theological tradition, and it's time to take them up again as uh, fertile concepts for theology. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Clark. That was excellent. Uh, we're very grateful that you did not participate in the Disciplina Arcani because... 
you brought forward the Kafalia's propitiatory effa box. So I was very grateful for that. <laughs> no, it, it was um, on Tuesday, the Holy Spirit worked through you to kind of put a hunger in us to receive Holy Eucharist. And today, I think the Holy Spirit put uh, something in your heart that was communicated to us to put a hunger for reading Hebrews. Uh, because just like Dr. Scott Hahn was able to offer a liturgical interpretation and understanding of Revelations, you have done so with the book of Hebrews, uh, which I am very grateful for, and I think many of us are grateful as well. Also grateful that you do not side with Calvin. <laughs> But in fact, hold that St. Paul is the author of the book of Hebrews, well, sort of, um, just in case if that's actually what happened when you go to heaven. <laughs> but we're very grateful for that. Actually, looking at uh, a liturgical understanding of sacrifice and the, the participatory nature of Paul's presentation in the book of Hebrews really looks at that one sacrifice offered for all and how the early church was able to live that out in liturgical expression. And one of the best ways of getting to that is, as you did it, Doctor, in such a wonderful way, is by canonical uh, criticism, which looks at how do you understand Scripture in the light of other Scripture passages that deal with similar things. And then that was solidified by looking at it in the fathers of the church and looking at that there is something about this sacrifice that St. Paul wrote about in the book of Hebrews that gave participation. And um, looking at the offering as a clear liturgical action uh, that allows us to participate in the offering of Jesus Christ, the one sacrifice in which we share in. So perhaps we could think of it and do the think of the think of this in these terms. Jesus said, "Do this," which is an action participating in the very sacrifice of Christ. In other words, the liturgical action is the fulfillment of the Melchizedekian priesthood by Jesus Christ, the priest who offers himself once and for all, and who has ascended into heaven, opening up heaven to us to participate and share in in the rituals of the early church through the priesthood of Jesus Christ, lived in the priest of Jesus Christ and offered with Christ for the community. Or perhaps we could think of it in these terms. Jesus, who ascended into heaven, opens up heaven for us, and his sacrifice, which we participate in and share in, is something that we share in as heaven and earth are experienced in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I'm very grateful to you, Dr. Clark, for really opening up the book of Hebrews in a new and invigorating way in which we can see the liturgical life of the church in the time of Hebrews and see that the liturgical life of the church is a sharing in the wedding of heaven and earth and our participation, maybe in a foretaste of heaven on earth. So thank you very much, Dr. Clark. And uh, you made so many wonderful points too that I didn't get to. So thank you for all of those. <laughs> <laughs>